Our movie opens with a 30-something man, Anders, played by Erlen Josephson, and I apologize if I butcher some or all of these names, rushing his wife Cecilia, played by Ingrid Thulin, into a hospital. Cecilia, a few months into pregnancy, is bleeding profusely. Something isn't right. The doctors try to save the baby, but fail. Cecilia spends a day or two in the hospital recovering from her miscarriage. Her roommates are the young 20-something Yurtis, played by B.B. Anderson, who has no support from the baby's father and is too afraid to tell her parents she's pregnant. Kom inte hemdragandes min unge, det säger och sånt. Det är inte sånt som varje mamma säger. Men när det gäller så tar hon nog ändå emot sin flicka. Det är min mamma inte. Hon har alltid varit så hög och fin på något vis. Fast pappa bara vanlig skogsarbetare. Pappa. Skulle nog inte bry sig så värst med kommet. Men mamma. And Stina, played by Eva Dahlback, who, along with her husband, played by Max von Sydow, is ecstatic and can't wait for her overdue baby to arrive. Men du, mm. tänk om, om skivan buktar så vattenångan då? Ah, inte plywood, ska man lilla det är hårt som fan. Ja, så? Nej, det slår sig inte. Mm. Allt det här låg du och räknade ut medan du inte kunde sova. Mm. Så måste jag gå upp och rita och greja, vet du. Så... Stod jag ett tag och snusade i din badrock. Och så fick jag ju lov att glänta lite på skåpdörren och kika på killens alla skjortor och byxor och allt andra. Så lommade jag in igen och jag somnade som ett skott. Du, mm. du är allt lika tokig som jag det. <laughs> The film touches on three different POVs of expecting or almost mothers as they wait in their sterile and claustrophobic hospital room. Director Ingmar Bergman wasn't terribly fond of this film later in his life, saying, Brink of Life is a modest and somewhat effeminate rag out, which probably was considered good in its time. Today, it is quite impossible and completely outdated. I don't think he's quite fair to this lesser known work. Is it dated to a degree? Sure, beyond Yurta smoking once while she's pregnant, or a nurse letting Stina drink some beer to help some medicine go down. Again, while she's pregnant, there's the fact that pregnancy is much safer today than 1958. There are still risks and stillbirths and miscarriages, certainly, but this movie implies losing your first baby is a common occurrence. But saying the film's impossible and inferring it has no bearing or connection with current society is flat out wrong. At the heart of Brink of Life are five ideas. The risks associated with pregnancy and childbirth, how those in your life and society will react to your pregnancy, the joy and possibilities of a child, the sorrow and apprehension of a newborn, and the loss of a life just coming into the world. Those will always be relatable. I will say the movie doesn't delve into some of those ideas very much, most of it is quite surface level actually, but I am happy Brink of Life takes its time when it counts. The opening sequence with Cecilia is good at building the real world tension that comes from such a pregnancy emergency. The tension is built on that sometimes casual and prolonged nature of hospitals. Doctors seem to take forever to come and see you, even if it's an emergency. Then I just want to know about the birth of Elias' birth month and day. 20 March 1930. And then the full name and flick name. Kristina Cecilia Elius, född Lindgren. Bostadsadress och telefon. Sederdalsgatan 23, 2018 79. Och vad har för Elius för yrke? Jag arbetar på skolöverstyrelsen. Sekreterare går bra att sätta. När var den sista regleringens första dag? Jag minns inte nu, syster. Men doktorn sa till min man i telefonen att det var brott. Bro, doktorn kommer så fort han kan och vi måste skriva in för Elius. Nurses and other staff come off as almost too calm as they slowly diagnose the problem while the patient panics and wants quick answers. Doktorn kommer på ögonblicket. Ring bara om det skulle vara något.
I remember being in the hospital when my wife was having our daughter, and every little hiccup before and after birth scared the hell out of me. Is the baby going to be okay? Is she not going to make it? It was on my mind each time, no matter how much I might have been overreacting. Break of Life captures that constant worry. Cecilia is also dealing with the realization her husband never loved her, that he never wanted a child, and that she's never considered herself strong enough to be a wife or single mother. She beats herself up about her inadequacies and how much she hates wanting a baby while simultaneously thinking she wouldn't be able to take care of it in the way it deserved. It speaks to so many of us who are parents or who are about to be parents who thought or think we weren't cut out for parenthood. Brink of Life gets to the heart and raw emotion so many of us feel regarding our fears of perceived parental shortcomings. On top of all that, Cecilia is beginning her lifelong journey of learning to cope with the loss of her child. She says, That is your avenue. Don't come out to you. I'm sorry, Ellen. They are coming out to eat again and scratch and sleep. I have already been asleep and scratch. Thank you all for coming out. Be careful with me. Blooms and books. And I am just that sort of stupid sister. And so I have my comrades and work. You can sense the loss in her voice. We're put in the shoes of a woman who's lost a part of herself that will never be replaced. She's wounded and will never fully heal. Stina's story suffers the most from underdevelopment. She's dying to be a mother. In her we see all the optimism and possibilities of a soon-to-be parent. What I find frustrating is Bergman and Ulla Saxon's text never gets richer than Stina and her husband are really excited about their child. Look, they've been designing the baby's room. Isn't that cute and enduring? It's too simple, and Bergman is capable of better analysis of the human condition than that. Why not examine why Stina is excited? Explore her hopes for the baby and the child's future, what having a kid means to her. The film wants to talk about pregnancy and parenthood, but it doesn't have enough to say about it. So it sticks to the shallows. Kept waiting for deeper discussions between Stina and the other women about all their stories, really, but especially Stina's. Those conversations too seldom came. And it's not like the setting was ill-fitted for a very talky movie about one of life's biggest events. These women seem to have very little else to do besides talk. Have them talk more about being mothers. Anyway, Eurydice is the opposite of Stina. She would happily wait forever for her baby. She doesn't want the baby to be born. Help me, I can't speak and scream and fix it with the tone. It's just a shit, in all of a sudden. It's just a shit, all the time. Not just a shit, in all of a sudden. I think I'm all of a sudden. I wish I had never been born. Oh, God, I wish I had never been born. It's not just now, but it's the only one I was little also. Och därför är Jördis rädd för att föda själv. Är det inte så? Är det rätt att man ska behöva när man känner så? Ibland måste man göra saker utan att fråga, Jördis. Jag kan inte. Jag kan inte. With no support from the man who got her pregnant, and a fear of rejection if she goes to her parents for help after she left home on bad terms, Yurtis' life is in the gutter, and she can't see it getting better from having a child. A hospital official tells her how the situation has changed for single mothers, but Yurtis doesn't see it that way. Nu vill jag bara skrämma mig så att jag bara gråta. Nej, lilla vän. Jag vill visst inte skrämma er. Jag är inte er lilla vän. Och ni vill ha mig att gråta, för då vet ni att jag blir mjuk. Och så när jag blir mjuk och inte längre vet vad jag säger, då tänker ni pumpa mig, lura mig och berätta, tvinga mig. Vi tänker absolut inte tvinga mig. Vi tänker tvinga mig att föda det man ni tänker. Mina pengar hit och pengar dit. Och hem här och hem där. Och är, är de inte underbara? Jag tycker de är äckliga. Äckliga och avförvärda. Och vet en sån som du om det va? Du har bara sitta och läst en massa böcker vid ett fint skrivbord. Du har väl aldrig själv glömt att dra dig hemma va? Aldrig sitter på jävla tatuerade armar, gräva i det! In Yurtis we see a lonely, scared young woman trying to protect herself with a thin veneer of cynicism. Since leaving home, she's obviously received no support from whoever she's chosen to have around her. Mix this with bad parental relationships and she's doubting the worth of her existence. I don't think she's even that against the baby. She, a little like Cecilia, just has no confidence she can take care of it because she feels inadequate about feeling abandoned by all. She fears she'll let down her child just like others have let her down, that she'll continue the cycle of failure. Det på nät något tänker jag. Den har inget gjort. Den är inte bättre för att komma till. 
Och så kommer jag ihåg hur var när jag själv var liten och ville hemifrån. Den brukar jag tänka. Vem har gjort så att jag skulle födas just här? Vem stämde det? Hon var det ändå bra hemma mot vad den här kommer att få det. Utan pappa och allting. Och så när den blir stor och kommer fråga här. Vad skulle du föda mig för? Det var mycket bättre att jag hade fått dö när jag blev född. While the weight on us may not be as severe and the situation as depressing, many of us who have been first-time parents have experienced some of this self-doubt and isolation, sometimes self-imposed. But if we look around, we can find support and hope in unexpected places. We can overcome the giant weight society has placed on us. These ideas are no stranger to movies about pregnancy, birth, and parenthood, but I appreciate Brink of Life's subtler, non-melodramatic look at them. While all these stories could have been better fleshed out, they all benefit from fine, darn fine, acting from our three leads. I know it seems odd to say it when you have scenes of such intense emotion and loss, but these actresses bring an understated tone to it all. They're unafraid to lay their emotions bare for the camera, but they don't overdo it. They play it like a person actually going through these major life episodes. To put it more simply, they play it for drama and not melodrama. That's really the right way to go in a film that's as stripped down and basic, in a good way, as Brink of Life. Bergman doesn't try to do anything fancy with camera setups or cinematography. He gives us a bare bones setting that perfectly frames the stories within. He's very matter of fact. This was, and in some cases still is, how things worked in pregnancy wards where you could find just as much sorrow as you could jubilation. I can say with certainty this isn't Bergman's best. This isn't a game-changing movie. This isn't as smartly written as it could be. But I decided to open Solomon Grundy Week with it because despite its flaws, it captures the joy fear, apprehensions, self-doubts, uncertainties, and possibilities that are at the root of birth. Hello everyone, hope you enjoyed the first day of Solomon Grundy week. If you liked it, please like and comment as they, especially the comments, help with YouTube's algorithm and the video being advertised to more people. If you're looking for more stuff I've done, in the video on the left I discuss David Lynch's Eraserhead and what it says about the negatives of parenting. Also don't forget to check out the next day of Solomon Grundy week with Tuesday's video, which you'll be able to see on the right if you're watching this video any other time besides its premiere day. Catch you next time.